Hey, good morning and welcome to Church 180. We are glad to have you with us today. We are continuing our study of Mark, so if you want to open your gospel to Mark chapter 1 this morning, you'll be, you'll be prepared and ready to go. We've spent time considering uh, Jesus is coming, as Mark tells it. Uh, the beginning of his story, what it looks like, what it looked like then, and today we're going to, to talk a little bit about what it looks like for us even now. Uh, we have been looking at the part of Jesus' coming, or at least Mark's telling it, right after John the Baptist preached a, a, a sermon of repentance, a message that we are called, all those who are responding, are called to, to repent of our sin. And then Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus comes preaching also a message of repentance, but instead of just preaching a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, he adds to it what? Believe the good news. Believe the good news. Yeah. And the good news is what? The kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven, or in Mark's words, the kingdom of God is near. Yeah. The kingdom of God is near. You know, I don't really remember probably as a early 20-something, uh, around the time that I entered the workforce full-time, I remember hearing, may have heard it before then, but I remember hearing the, the, the wisdom offered me about, about investing, about investing for the future. And I'm getting a head nod. Some of you may be familiar with what that wisdom is. And when you tell a young person who's all about we were just laughing before the service, you know, getting out and funding their shopping habit. Uh, but what is the wisdom given to young people about managing their finances and for the purpose of future? What is that wisdom given in your own words? Anybody? Anybody? Don't buy it if you don't have the money to pay for it. Don't buy it if you don't have the money to pay for it. Yep. It yep. In the store. Live within That's your right. means. Live within your means. Time is the one variable that you have control of now. You got it. You got it. Time is the variable you have. Say more about that in terms of how does that play out in instructions for investing? For investing, time is the great exponential multiplier. It is. Um, and as a young investor, it's the only time that you have the opportunity and you can approach it from the position of taking advantage of the one variable that you can control at that time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a great message. It's a hard message when you're young. It's not really a popular message, right? I mean, I maybe maybe I'm putting something on you that's undeserved, but uh, it's certainly the case in my I, I mean, I had things that I wanted, you know, I was excited, I was earning money, it was my money. I get to spend it how I want. And somebody's saying, no, 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 actually there's something you might ought to do with that money instead. <laughs> and so, <laughs> give it to mom, that's right, that's right. That's always a good message, right? Um, the message has very much to do with time. The message has to do with a long-term and a short-term perspective. We're going to talk about that this morning a little bit in light of our call as disciples because there's very much um, a meaning today as well as there was back in in the gospel era when Mark was telling us the story of Jesus. This perspective then is a perspective now that has wisdom in it, both short-term and long-term. So hold on to that as we, we enter into the story. You remember from the past two weeks, if you've been present with us or watched on video, that we've talked about both Jesus' baptism and his, his being driven in some translations or entering into being led by the Spirit into the wilderness and the temptations that he felt, the temptations that were presented to him and he was challenged, he was tempted, it was a trial before God's great enemy, right? And then there's a the move following that time in the wilderness 
where Jesus begins on his, his mission, his ministry. He steps out into the area of Galilee and he begins to preach a message of good news. And the message centers on that good news being the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. Now we're going to look this morning at, at that passage in light of what happens next in our story. Let me draw your attention to a couple of words. Pay attention to place in this story. Place and time. Starting in verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee. There's a time element here. After John was put in prison. There's a sequence of events. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time, he said, has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So there's a place a specific place, he's in Galilee. Galilee being an area, really, more than a specific dot. Encompassing villages kind of around the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias or, or other names that it's known as. And it's, it's talking about villages that were primarily on the northern and western side, but, but that, that general area that we know as Galilee, this is where Jesus has entered and he's preaching a message that the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news, he says. And then immediately it says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, again, where those villages were and where you would expect to find people from those villages participating in whatever activities of the day, he sees Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Now again, I asked you to keep up with place and time. He's in the area of Galilee, not the area of most prominence in that day and age. He's not in Jerusalem. He's not where all of the national uh, great activity and places of significance are, he's out in an area that, that was important, had a lot of activity, but would not have been the center of religious activity. He is, if you will, in the midst of people just coming and going in their regular ways of life. And he sees these two fishermen, Simon and Andrew. Now it says he sees them casting their net into the lake. And it gives you the idea, some say, that maybe they're using hand nets, if you will. Maybe they're just standing on the shore and they're throwing nets in. And, and so these would have been nets you could handle by, by just your hands. But then he goes on a little farther and he sees James and John in the boat which indicates they might have been using a little larger nets, drag nets perhaps. Either way, you've got guys dealing with their own professions, if you will, going about their daily business. I would imagine that if, that if Simon and Andrew are casting a net right in the middle of their work, and the sons of Zebedee are preparing their nets, well, they're kind of in between, right? They've already maybe done their work ahead of time. They're fishing. Now they're preparing for the next go-round. In either way, 
these guys are busy. They're not goofing off. They're not standing around. They're busy at their work. And Jesus comes up and says, Come, follow me. I don't know how you've read that. I know this is not a new story to you. Certainly not a new story to me. And somehow, for some reason that I'm not really able to explain to you today, I've always read this as an invitation. Kind of in a tone of, come, follow me. <clears throat> I was challenged this week in my reading from what other interpreters of the scripture, commentators say, that maybe it should be read a little differently. Maybe it should be read, come, follow me. Do you hear the difference? One's a bit of an invitation. One's a bit of a command. Either way, there's a time element involved. When? At once. Now. Now. Right? Now. And there's an element of time for Simon and Andrew and James and John. That element is when? Now. Come. Right follow. Then, then. Right then and right there. And what the text tells us is for Simon and, and his brother Andrew, they left their nets and followed him. Go ahead. Why? Why? If if they didn't know him, didn't know of him. Right. He hadn't been performing miracles at that point. Not that we're told, that's right. What was the motivation for them to follow an itinerant who just came along and said, Come, sure. follow me? It's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. Go ahead. It must be a God thing. Must be a God thing. That's a good answer. There was something that compelled them yeah. to give up their uh, profession. That's right. And That's walk right. away from it immediately. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I don't normally encourage you. You know, when I'm encouraging you to read in your study of the Word, I normally tell you to read which direction backwards, right? To make sure you've got the context that we're in. I don't normally encourage you to read forward, but in this particular case, and what Jim's talking about, if you read forward to the very next story, and, and just after that you discover why it is, perhaps, that these guys just immediately responded. And you're right. It is a God thing, Terry. What is it? There's an authority. Presence present, excuse me, in Jesus' words. There is perhaps an authority in his way of carrying himself. His whole demeanor. His, his whole demeanor. Yeah. I mean, let's go. Yeah. 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 I'm sure it was the tone also that he used. Mm -hmm. Could be. That's when right. When he did the invitation. Yeah. Yeah. I, Come, follow me. Yeah. The I tone. said the tone, the the tone. tone that okay. he used. Yeah, tone of voice. Either way, picture yourself not reading a story of old that we're familiar with that has a warm feeling to it because Jesus calls and the guys immediately follow and everybody lives happily ever after. Except it's a little different. These guys are in the middle of their jobs. They're working for a living. They're doing what you do on a daily basis. And in the middle of your work, probably not on a coffee break, along comes Jesus and he says, Hey, Sam, follow me. <clears throat> Come, follow me. I'm sorry. Uh, this is true what James says, actually. Uh, Come, follow me. Uh, I've always been thinking about this. That's the job. That's the meal of bread. That's the, the way to eat. I mean, it's not easy for me. Somebody go to my job and say, Sam, come. No, I man, this is my bread and butter. Right. I just won't get up and leave like this. Excuse me? Uh, can you see I'm you know, working? 
Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. So imagine the thoughts going through their minds. The text doesn't tell us. The story doesn't really fill in the details of what they contemplated. It just says, <coughs> at once, they left. And it's interesting with the sons of Zebedee. They're there with their father. Right. And they leave him. Yeah. And it doesn't say anything about Zebedee going, wait a minute. Where are you going? Where are you going? Right. Yeah. You work to do. That's right. So we go back to this, this idea, this question, this, this emphasis on time. And not to lose sight of the question I asked you earlier, or the comments we were, the discussion we were having on, on investment strategy, there is a short-term time element here. Come, and they leave immediately. There must also be a long-term. Yes? Or no? Yeah, because he didn't say how long to follow him. <laughs> yeah. Well, he just said, follow me. True. There was no carrot out there. Right. There's no tangible objective. Right. There's no stated goal. There's just come, follow me. Now, as you were talking just a few minutes ago, uh, imagining that happening to us today, excuse me, I'm on my job, um, and right in the middle of this, uh, maybe you wouldn't even say that. Maybe you would just be baffled. Why are you calling me? What? To me, that's what part of the is <coughs> in because they were so receptive. They didn't question them if they did it. Yeah. To me, that says somebody was working in them. Yeah. Unbeknownst to them. The implication certainly is that something was significant enough in their understanding of what was happening, that they went without really doing a lot of questioning or contemplating, right? Mm -hmm. And as we've already mentioned, later on it would be said and understood by people who were watching him and listening to him. He talked. He spoke with an authority that was unlike others that they were familiar with. I throw a supposition out. Okay. Or a possibility. Sure. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Yeah. And John the Baptist made some very startling claims about who Jesus is. He did. And then Jesus was taken into the wilderness for 40 days. So for 40 days, a uh, prophet who was getting lots of people coming to him, I would suggest that that reputation mm. has already preceded Jesus when he comes before his first disciples. Might have. It might have. They had an idea of, that's, oh. Yeah. It's interesting that John doesn't really flesh that out. He doesn't really tell us what all was going on. And if you're a student of the Gospels, if you've spent time comparing, say, Matthew and Mark, or, or Mark and Luke, or even Matthew, Mark, and Luke versus John, you'll know that, that Mark is the shortest. And Mark gets right to the point. And I don't say that to, to discredit or disparage the other Gospels. Mark seems to be writing for a different purpose. I don't know how much you've studied what your knowledge is about the background of Mark, but it's generally believed that Mark received much of his information from the Apostle Peter. And the Apostle Peter, tradition tells us, was in Rome where he was killed. And so there are a lot of opinions, scholarly opinions, that say Mark may have written his gospel following Peter's death as a way to capture all that he said and to make it available to those Christians 
and anybody else reading in that moment. Well, what was the moment? Well, again, historians and other scholars tell us that what was happening in Rome at that time was that an emperor named Nero was there. And if you remember anything about Nero from your studies, you'll know he was a wicked emperor from a perspective of Christians. He was a fiddler. <laughs> yeah, some would say. The importance of me bringing this up, regardless of all the details I'll leave out in our conversation today, is that it was a critical time for followers of Jesus. It was a very difficult time. They were being challenged not just in making decisions about their careers, their very lives were at stake because they were the recipients, they were the object of Nero's blame for a fire that destroyed a huge area of Rome. So in that context of the readers of the story that Mark's telling, they would have very much been listening to the time element because their time was very likely short. So Mark gets right to the point. Jesus came. John the Baptist gave witness to who he was. He prepared the way. Then, then God prepares Jesus by having him baptized and sending the Spirit. He further prepares him by sending him into the wilderness where he's tempted because remember, in Jesus' birth, he becomes human. The Son of God becomes human, like us. He had to to redeem us, right? I'm telling big swaths of information in very concise terms. Why, as a human, was it important for Jesus to go into the wilderness? Because God's mortal enemy, mortal enemy if I can say it that way, Satan, had tripped up the first human and all humans previously by tempting them. Mm -hmm. And they turned away. Jesus had to go into that same wilderness to be tempted and come out victorious. And he does. And immediately he begins to tell the kingdom of God, as the king himself speaking, has come near. You need to hear that, in other words, now. The kingdom is here. If you were in such a situation and someone with great authority walked into your life wherever you were at the moment and said, a significant change has happened, come. You might just come. This is a sense of what's going on here. And he says, I will send you out to fish for people. Now, if you think of fishing as a leisure sport, this doesn't have a lot to say to you. But if you think of fishing as a vocation, if you think of fishing as a means for providing for you and your family, and if you envision using nets to catch fish, well, what happens? The fish are caught. And that's kind of the end for the fish. What was <laughs> is no longer, regardless of which kind of net you use. There's an urgency. There's an immediate action that forever changes the future the existence for those fish. Jesus says, I'll make you fishers of people. Hmm. What's the implication? The same thing. Um, the, the word of God is the net. Yeah. And the same way that the fishes, when they go into that net, eventually if you take them out of the water, they will die. That's right. They become dinner. They become dinner. So the same way when, when, when man goes through the Word of God, change. Right. 
profound change. Yes. Absolutely. There's an urgency. There's an immediacy. There is a significant never to return change mm -hmm. made. It's a fascinating thing to consider when we think of Jesus' presence in our lives, maybe his call on your life today. Do you view it in this way? Do we see Jesus coming in and saying, Come, if I can add to it, now, follow me. If I put it in the context of Rome at that time, when scholars say this, was, this message was going out through the writing of Mark, well, it's not hard to understand. If I'm being persecuted as a Christian, and my life is on the line in the here and now, I get that there's an immediacy. You don't have a lot of time to dilly-dally around and make decisions. But I wonder how that resonates in your mind today with our calling. We're not, in most instances, in a life-threatening situation. When Jesus comes and calls to you or to you or to anybody out there, in our culture, our society, our places and time and, and space, there's not the sense of urgency that's immediately in my face. So I have to go back to this sense of investment advice. There's a short-term decision. Come, follow me. Or, you know, hey, I'm kind of busy right now. You might be a great guy, and yes, yeah, someday I'd like to follow you, but man, I got a lot of things I got to take care of right now. There's a lot of things I'd like to do. You know, I, I, I really like to get that boat, or maybe that place at the beach, or whatever it is. Maybe that's too much. Maybe it's just simply I'd like to pay off some debts, or I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to, whatever you might fill in. And yet, the call today is just as it has been. Come, follow me. Something's stirring in you, I, I can tell. I think the call is a little different. Okay. From this perspective. Sure. Um, he asked those four individuals, mm -hmm. or I'll rephrase that. Sure. He gave a... Um, invitation or a command sure to come follow me right and they left everything including their profession correct he isn't necessarily calling us today to leave our profession correct he's calling us to leave our lifestyle that's right and make a change in our lifestyle yeah and what else um he Any? also calls us to then go and tell others. I mean, he, he does. Our lifestyle change yep. is going to elicit questions. Sure. What's different about you? What's going on? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? That's right. You yeah. Know, that type of stuff. Now, feel free to jump in and help Jim here. I need a lot. No, I didn't mean that. I just mean you're right in what you've said, but to back up before we get to that stage of people asking, questions and our call to go out and share the gospel inside us when that call comes it is a call to a change in lifestyle why what what is the call before the change in lifestyle to repent to repent, repent. of what of sin which is what separate us from god and it looked like Loyalties. Yeah. What what he's calling is for our heart. He wants our heart to be completely his. He does. And our lifestyle. Yeah. Well, if our heart changes, if our heart's completely God's, yeah. Christ's, yeah. our lifestyle has to change. That's right. Because I'm no, no longer right. living for myself. I'm no longer living for my partner. I'm no longer living for my children or my country or my job. I'm living for God. Which could be 
in the sense that when we talk about the heart being emotional, it could be that. But it better also be the mind. Yeah. Because the decision you make is life-changing. Right? In its entirety. Just like, although the fish didn't decide to get caught. They walk into it. Life oh, they swim changed it. forever. <laughs> yeah. And so it's a complete reorientation. To put it in different language, it's a radical reorientation. It's a denial of everything that was in terms of loyalty and obligation and responsibility. And instead, he becomes first. It doesn't mean an abdication of everything that was. I mean, we know from other, from other readings and writings and stories, from, again, read a little farther into to John's Gospel, and you realize Peter was married. Peter's mother-in-law was living in his house. Well, that didn't... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't catch that commentary on the video. Uh, <clears throat> never mind. Uh, <laughs> Peter continued his life that continued his relationship. So I don't mean to say that Jesus' call says, forget everything you've had. That's gone completely. But regardless of the circumstance, there is a similarity in that there's a call for an immediate, permanent change in loyalty. Because in a kingdom, there's only one king. And you either follow or you don't. There's no ands, ifs, or buts in there. One huge difference <coughs> between the fish swimming into the net, but he probably didn't even know what they were doing. They had no choice. I mean, it just happened. They were just swimming around and got caught. <coughs> Whereas if you get caught in Christ's net, God's net, it is a choice, and you don't die, you get life. That's exactly it's right. exactly opposite. And yet, there's a death involved. Oh, a death of the old self. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you're right. Plus, there's a death of the old in order to have the life new. in the new. <laughs> the old life had a time frame on it, didn't it? Mm -hmm. The new life doesn't. So in the investment advice scenario, I'm foregoing what's on the short end, what's on the front end, in order to reap the benefits long term, which will far exceed the benefits on the short term. Nevertheless, it's a radical change. It's a radical decision. It's a costly one. I bring that up today because we celebrate communion the first Sunday of each month. And again, for me, maybe for you, I have to sometimes really focus to keep communion from just being a ritual that I participate in. I have to pre prepare my heart and my mind for what I'm getting ready to do. What I'm saying in the spiritual realm, if not in the human realm. What I'm doing and what it says I'm doing. I'm answering the call when I take the bread and the juice. When I ask for the Lord's body and blood to come into me and become my own, I'm come, follow now. Right here. It's a radical reorientation. And it's one I think sometimes we, we might do well to, to contemplate a little more than we have. It's one that I think we would do well to consider the opportunities. But not to forget the cost. And I wonder if doing such contemplation if counting the cost in such a way 
and then answering yes. Then coming and following, if you will, by taking the elements. And letting that once again remind us of the radical reorientation of our loyalties. The radical reorientation of our priorities. The radical reorientation of our investment strategy. I wonder how our living would witness differently to those around us. I wonder what invitation others might experience when they're around us. So it's a both and. It's a what, what's possible? What's actually anticipated and maybe even expected to change in me when I say yes the first time and each time I participate in communion? And what impact may it have on others around me and around you? Jesus still comes close. The kingdom of God is here. It didn't come and then leave. He is still king. He still speaks with authority, unlike any other. And he still calls each and every human being on the planet to come and follow. May we choose wisely. May we contemplate our answer, base our answer on a long-term investment strategy for a life that not only doesn't end, it just gets better over time. May the word of the Lord work its way and will in us. Amen. For the glory of God and the blessing of us.